Okay, so after Maharaj's brilliant exposition on the third verse of the Upadeshamrita, so we'll now be looking at text number two of the Upadeshamrita. Um, we will be trying to elaborate and bring out some of the key points here. And again, we beg for Maharaj's blessings and blessings of all the Vaishnavas for your mercy. Things can always um, unfold in an auspicious way. Okay, so um, I'll just say, okay, a bit closer. Is it better? Okay. So um, I'll just chant the verse and then we'll try and read the translation and take it from there. Um, it's not there. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I'm just there. Atyaras prayasyas cha. Prajalpo niyamagraha. Gyana sankascha lulyam cha. Sadbi bhakti vinasyati. Okay, so I'll read the translation and then we'll begin. Our discussion on this again, very, very wonderful set of instructions from Sri Rupa Goswami. One's devotional service is spoiled when he becomes too entangled in the following six activities. Excuse me. Number one, eating more than necessary or collecting more funds than required. Number two, over endeavouring for mundane things that are very difficult to obtain. Number three, talking unnecessarily about mundane subject matters. Number four, practicing the scriptural rules and regulations only for the sake of following, uh, only for the sake of following them and not for the sake of spiritual advancement or rejecting the rules and regulations of the scriptures and working independently or whimsically. Five, associating with worldly minded persons who are not interested in Krishna consciousness and six, being greedy for mundane achievements. Okay, so we're going to get into this a bit more with reference to Prabhupada's purport and also the writings of Shula Bhakti Vinod Thakur and his Bhakti Lokya. Okay, but we'll say Mangalachar and then we'll go from there. Omegyanitamirandasya kyananjana shalakaya Chakshum militam yena tasmai shri karavena maha shri chaitanya manobishtam stapitam yena bhutale swayam rupa kadamayam dadati swapadanti kam vandeham shri guru shri yuta padakamalam shri gurun vaishnavamscha Sri Rupam Sakrachatam Sahakana Raganatam Vitam Twam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sabadutam Purjana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahakana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitam Sha <coughs> Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sutta Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhyevacha Patita Nam Bhavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Shri Vasadi Gorabhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So, where should we begin? So, just a point on this principle, general principle. We need in our spiritual lives to know two things. We need to know what we're aiming for, 
and we need to know what to avoid. Why? Because the material energy is very, very powerful and very, very strong and very intelligent. It's not enough to know what you're going for. You also need to know the things that you should be careful to avoid because otherwise those things can sneak up on you. You see the point? You may be aiming for something and you may not realize that there are certain things creeping into your life that will stop you from achieving your goal. So the teachings, the Shastra are very clear on this point, that we understand the things that we are looking to realize or looking to do, and we also understand the things that will stop us and that will actually um, sabotage our endeavor. Does that make sense? So in all activity, these things are actually there. Huh? It's actually a very, very, again, a very powerful and, and intelligent point. Always keep your eye on the goal and be careful to recognize the Maya so that she doesn't come in. I remember <laughs> His Holiness Tamal Christian Raj recalling a pastime that he had with Srila Prabhupada. So they were on the train and... Um, there was, it was quite full, but Tamal Krishnamaraj had, had a little space next to him on the train. So there was a family, and um, he didn't realize it was a family. He thought it was just one man. So he, he um, motioned over to the man that there's a seat here. So the man went and sat down. Then the man, he motioned to his wife that there's a seat there. So she came and squeezed in. Then she motioned to her children that there's a seat next to her. So they came in, and Tamal Krishnamaraj was basically forced out of his seat because he'd given some space, <laughs> and then one by one these people would come in. So Tamal Krishnamaraj told Srila Prabhupada, and Srila Prabhupada said, yes, this is the nature of Maya. <laughs> he said, you don't give her any room. You give her a little inch, she'll come and take over completely. Huh? So this, this verse is powerful from, the, from this point of view. But it's also a principle. If you want to be robust and powerful in anything that you do, you should know exactly what you're trying to achieve and exactly the things that can sabotage your achievement. In, in the secular world, when people, I don't know if you get this here so much, but in London sometimes, and in America, you'll get salesmen calling you up trying to sell you things, right? And these salesmen, they are trained in what's called objection handling. So before they call you, they've already thought about what your objections could be for buying their product. Right? And they actually prepare so that when you say, I don't want to buy your product because of X, Y, and Z, they've got an answer to your objection. Right? They're thinking so far ahead. They know what they want to achieve. They know how you may get out of it, and they've got ways to actually stop you from getting out of buying their product. Mm -hmm. So this principle is very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. So Marge has explained very wonderfully exactly those activities which are favorable. And now Sri Rupa Goswami is, is explaining to all of us, these are the things that you do not want to creep into your life. Mm -hmm. And if these things are in our lives at the moment, these are the things that we want to move out of our life. In our International Society for Krishna Consciousness, to be honest, there are many, we are like people running a marathon. But the, the, one, the kind of shocking thing in many senses, and this relates to what we said earlier, the shocking thing is that we don't understand that when we're running a marathon, so many of us, are running a marathon and we've got something tied against our, our leg, right? You know, in, in, um, if you have a weight, a heavy weight, tied around your leg and you're trying to run in the marathon, does it work? No. Now, what happens if you don't even know that you have some weight tied around your leg? Right? You're running the marathon, you'll think it's a marathon. You'll think, it's just the nature of this marathon is so difficult. Until someone points out to you that actually you could run this marathon much faster if you just unchained 
if you just removed this particular thing which is slowing you down. Does that make sense? So these are the six things that are slowing us down. And we will do some analysis. We may find that to different degrees we are engaging in some of these things which are unfavorable. Mm -hmm. To different degrees. And the proposition we have for you is that you can actually run this race much faster. Our proposition is that you can actually make much greater advancement if we remove these particular things from our lives. So in our society of devotees, we may find that people have these invisible weights. And my is so smart that unless we are studying such literatures, we won't even know that we're carrying this heavy burden in our endeavor to reach the goal. Mm -hmm. Some people they are moving forward, but it's much more endeavor because of these weights. For other people, the weight becomes heavier and heavier, and then you turn around one day, and you don't even see the person in the association of Vaishnavas. A few years ago, um, there was one person that we knew, my family and I knew, who was interested in Krishna consciousness. Very nice person, like that. Had had some difficulties in exchanges with her family and other things. And so she was at university and she was interested in Krishna consciousness. And then what happened was she started to have certain types of association. So first of all, she was very interested, very enthusiastic, reading, inquiring, asking questions. She started to chant. Then she started to get certain types of association. And it was interesting to see because what we saw was exactly what's indicated here. After a while, there was doubts. Well, you know, how do you know that Krishna is actually God? After a while, the practice of chanting stopped. You know, I don't have time because I've got to do these other things. Actually, what was happening is she felt some embarrassment amongst those people that she was associating with in them knowing that she was a devotee or she was practicing Krishna consciousness. I think sometimes she would tell people and they would challenge her and then they put doubts into her mind. And then eventually it got to a point she was going to parties and when she was asked, but you know, is this favorable to your devotion? So she said, oh, it's okay. Um, when I'm at the party and I'm dancing, I'm remembering Krishna. You know, I'm remembering that this is, this is not you know, good. and I'm seeing that people are unhappy and it's helping my Krishna consciousness. Seriously, this is a real situation. And then eventually, nowhere to be seen. Eventually, nowhere to be seen. I, we haven't heard from this person for years. Hmm? Now, this is something that may happen in so many places, but we should always remember that what's happening is that person's opportunity in this lifetime to be completely freed of all suffering and to return to the spiritual world, to never take birth again in any material situation, and to never experience any type of suffering whatsoever. That opportunity may have been lost for, this, for the rest of this lifetime. Mm -hmm. We have to remember what we're doing. We have to remember how, how valuable the goal is. Because if we remember how valuable the goal is, then we'll keep our eyes out, we'll keep our vigilance and we'll, and we'll keep a focus on what we're meant to achieve and we'll keep being very careful to see that nothing is sneaking into our life space. This, actual, this is a strategy by Maya. This is one of the classic strategies. Because she knows that you know what the goal is, it's very easy just to get you by sneaking into your life with so many other things and it comes a bit by bit, by bit, to the point that you turn around one day and you think, how did Maya get into my house? How did she get into my life? Because Prabhupada said she comes in like a needle <laughs> and out like a plow, right? <clears throat> it's very, very important. So these are the things that we are meant to be on guard against. Huh? And we will do some analysis to see to what extent we are free 
of these six enemies in one sense. Uh, okay, so let us first of all list them again and then we can go through them and kind of expand on that point. So the first one was eating more than necessary or collecting more funds than required. Okay, now this is an interesting one, right? Eating more than necessary. And we've heard in the first verse, Vacha Vegam Manasakroda Vegam Jiva Vegam Mutara Pasta Vegam Etam Vegam Yovishahetu Dira Savam Apimam Privivim Shashishyat. We've heard about the, the urges of the tongue, the belly, the genitals. Let's, cut, let's connect the dots a little. Right? What are we doing in Krishna consciousness? Right? What has Srila Prabhupada come to do? Let's analyze this. You have a Nitya Siddha Vaishnava who's come from the spiritual world uh, under instruction by Krishna. He is coming here to propagate Krishna consciousness all over the world. Right? You have the material world which is full of living entities who are envious of Krishna. What is the purpose of our movement? The purpose of this International Society for Krishna Consciousness is to get the living entities of this material world to accept the very person that they've come here to reject. The very person who we do not want to see <laughs> the very person who we're trying to take the position of, Srila Prabhupada has come here to turn that whole thing around, 180 degrees, and get people who are running away from God to turn back to Him. Mm -hmm. And that is particularly um, marked in the Western world, right? with the so-called materially advanced societies. Huh? where they become sophisticated in their atheism. Hmm? So it's a complete contrast to what the living entity in this conditioned world is looking for. To do something like this, to achieve a goal like this, takes great potency and great determination. Hmm? Where does that determination come from? Here it talks about overeating. We know that the tongue, belly and genitals are in a line. So when people don't control the tongue, everything else in that line is also disturbed. So when Maharaj was speaking earlier, he made this point, very powerful point, very profound point, about the determination uh, relating to one being able to give up or being free of the desire for sense gratification, in particular, Maharaj spoke about sex life. Yeah. So, there is an underlying principle behind it all, and that is the principle of trying to enjoy separately from Krishna. Hmm? We actually, as we let this first shackle go, we will find that we will access more control, more strength, more determination. In the secular world, in personal development, they talk about people realizing their potential. For devotees, our ability and our capacity to move forward in devotional life, it comes to the extent that we are following these pure personalities. We take shelter of them by following their instruction. And what they're telling us through these pages is that you can move closer to Krishna much faster. There are six invisible weights on, the, on, the, on the, each practicing devotee that you can remove that will move you leaps forward. And the first one here is this point about overeating or overcollecting. Yeah, that's overeating or overcollecting. And we mention that also in relation to the point that our lives, unfortunately, are much more complex than they need to be. It was not meant to be this difficult. Mm -hmm. And we have to constantly remember that. We need to separate real Krishna consciousness from misapplied Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. Misapplied Krishna consciousness is something that is not spoken about so much in our movement. Misapplied Krishna consciousness is when I don't know the teachings. 
I know a little and I add a whole range of material things to my life and I say that this is all Krishna consciousness, it's so difficult. Real Krishna consciousness is available to every single one of us. Real Krishna consciousness is that if I'm going to do something, I need to know exactly how to do it expertly. Right? There's a vast difference between doing Krishna consciousness and doing Krishna consciousness expertly. This nectar of instruction is for those who want to perform devotional life expertly. Hmm? You have two people running a race. One person, he is expert. He's trained. He's been coached. He's been practicing. And now, where they're about to run, right? he knows what, he's, what he wants to do. He knows what the goal is. He knows how to achieve it. He's done all the practice. And then you have another person on the same race. So what they have in common is they both have the same goal. The difference is one of them is expert. One of them knows how to expertly achieve the goal and the other one is not really so clear on how to achieve it. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, my question for each and every one of us is which one of these two categories do we fall into? Are you expert in your application of Krishna consciousness? Are we conscious of these six things? Are we careful to avoid these six things? Do we go deeply into the teachings to know how to perform this devotional service properly? There's an underlying principle behind all of this. And this is spoken about by Srila Prabhupada in the Krishna book and in Srimad Bhagavatam. That when devotional service is done in knowledge, that is considered devotional service in the mode of goodness. Mm -hmm. And Prabhupada distinctly writes that when devotional service is practiced in the mode of goodness, in knowledge, huh, one makes more advancement. One achieves more mercy. Mm -hmm. So these are the things that we need to change in our lives. Huh? Don't be fooled by the material energy. What Maya wants you to think is that all devotional service is being practiced, is all the same and it's all difficult. No, it's not true. The reality is there are varying degrees of expertise. There's varying degrees of expert application of Krishna consciousness. The more expertly you apply Krishna consciousness, the more you receive the mercy, the more you relish. Shu shu come. And this is the point that we must always remember. Krishna, the Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, all the acharyas, they want you to have the best. So they would not give you any instruction unless it's actually the best for you. And I'm saying this because, to be honest, in many people's minds, there's an underlying fear of following. Again, we don't talk about this so much, but we think, if I have to do all the things that the scripture says, I mean, I'm not going to enjoy so much. You know, I mean, I, I want to do some of them because I'm a, I'm a devotee, but can't I do a few other things here and there? Because wouldn't it, what, can't I enhance Rupa Goswami's instructions? Right? He's given something, but I can enhance it. I can do a few extra bits and pieces and it will be nicer. It's not true. Rupa Goswami is the leader of all the six Goswamis. Huh? Why is he the leader of all the six Goswamis? Because he's the most expert in relishing the mellows of devotional service. He is the most expert. Huh? So when he is giving such an instruction, I mean, you, it wouldn't be possible to conceive of what he experiences. It is outside the realms of human conception. Huh? What he, as a Nityasiddha Vaishnava, is experiencing. And by connotation, what he's giving us in instruction is unlimitedly potent. These are keys that are going to take us further to Krishna. Hmm? So again, focusing and emphasizing what we said before, attentiveness. Heartfelt, enthusiastic engagement with the teachings. As Maharaj also echoed, please meditate on this. And we are hopefully 
looking to see how we will live these things. We will do an analysis of these six, a real cold analysis in relation to how these six ghosts are haunting our devotional life at the present moment. Hmm? Yeah, so it's like a kind of like material exorcism. We're going to remove some of these impediments uh, to our devotional life. Right. So, let's elaborate on this first point. Overeating, over endeavoring. Let me just get to my notes. Okay. So, so this overeating, over collecting. Okay. I'll read this statement. This is a statement by Bhakti Notako from Sri Bhakti Aloka. Okay, so he says, if one can transform all his bodily activities into activities favorable to the devotional service of the Lord, then that is bhakti yoga. We're very lucky. Our teaching is not like mundane religion, right? Um, His Grace Ravinda Sarup was making, his senior devotee was making a point that the, the sense enjoyers, right, the whole idea of just trying to enjoy your senses, this is the normal material, this is like the, sta- the, the normal way of being, right? The thesis, you could call it. Right? It's sometimes in, in academic circles, they, they term it like this. Then you have the opposite of that. The opposite of that is where you have the people who want to um, just renounce the world, right? The kind of impersonal renunciation, the kind of false um, renunciation, that we, just, we, we don't engage in anything because everything is, is fraught with difficulty. Right? So you have the sense and joy on one side, you have the so-called renunciate on the other. He was explaining that Krishna consciousness is not the thesis of just trying to enjoy the world. It's not the antithesis, the opposite of just trying to reject the world. But Krishna consciousness is the synthesis. It's the two things coming together in a very holistic way. In other words, devotional service is inclusive. As is explained by Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur here. Here we're talking about control. We're talking about not overeating, not overcollecting. But we're also recognizing that this is achieved through balance. And he goes on to explain that if we take too much then our Krishna consciousness gets lost due to being controlled by material mellows or being so much attached and entangled in material stimulation. He says on the other side, because he's balanced, he says, if we take too little, then the body, which is our means of worship, will not be protected. Hmm? So this is a very, very powerful and very elegant balance. Right? So when we talk about not overeating and not overcollecting, what we mean is dealing in this world, taking what we need in this world, a healthy degree, but not too much and not too little. Huh? There's a very, when I, when I first heard this, I mean, it just really knocked me out. There was a point that Prabhupada makes in 7th Canto of Bhagavatam. He says something which... When I heard it, I was like, I, I can't believe this. And I tried to listen again and try to understand it. He says that someone who's too poor, they can't take to Krishna consciousness. Yeah. And there was actually a, converse, there was a, there was a conversation. Prabhupada came to one country. And he was saying that the people here, they won't be able to take to Krishna consciousness because they're too poor. Hmm? Very, very interesting. And you find it's completely in line with, with what's given by Srila Bhattu no Thakur. If it's too little the mind is disturbed because their bare necessities are not taken care of and it's hard to turn the mind and focus on Krishna because they're just in a survival mentality. Too much, the person doesn't want to rely on Krishna because they think that they're God, because they think that by their resources they can control everything. Hmm? Both things are problematic. When there's balance, when there's balance, there's power. We should be striving as devotees to really maintain a dynamic and healthy balance. Otherwise, we make 
big mistakes because when one area becomes imbalanced, then it affects other areas of our lives. Huh? So think about these points very carefully for yourself. Maybe we'll do this as our first exercise. We'll deal with this principle. Hmm? Think about your own life. Huh? Would you say that in terms of your accumulation of resources, <clears throat> would you say that you are balanced? Would you say that you are over-endeavoring? Or would you say that you are under-endeavoring? Hmm? I'm just giving you a few moments to contemplate that. You don't have to say anything, but just think about that principle for yourself. Are we living as Vaishnavas in a state of balance? Hmm? How many times Krishna speaks in the Bhagavad Gita about being equipoised? Hmm? Think about it. Are we living life in a state of balance? I would like you to rate your own Krishna consciousness, your life at the present moment, between 0 to 10. 10 means that your balance is perfect, it's ideal. 0 means you are completely out of balance. Think of these two things. Number one, honestly, where are you on that scale? And number two, what could you do practically that would bring about more balance? Huh? Think about this point. Where are you on that scale? And what could you do practically that would bring about more balance? In various countries in the world, devotees are working so many hours. Right? And the idea is that yes, you know, we can, we can do our duty and engage in devotional service, yes. But then we have to see this, the way we're working. Is it such that we're able to have the energy and the time to nicely cultivate our devotional life? Hmm? Bear in mind that the world today is not neutral, as we said before. It's designed in such a way that you are encouraged to work like a slave. Hmm? And to be honest with you, when we say encourage to work like a slave, we're not even talking about the time alone. The, behind the time is how much your energy is drained, isn't it? Many of you have that experience. Even if you have time, if you have no energy, what can you do with that time? So we have to make these decisions consciously. If we actually follow these books, you know what the funny thing is, <laughs> to be honest? If these books were followed deeply, you'll see future generations, they won't live Krishna consciousness the way that we do. Hmm? As our movement develops more, and as people are trained deeply in these teachings, deeply, before they jump into a situation, you'll see people will live life very, very differently. Hmm? Prabhupada said, I think the third generation, they'll be able to light fire by mantra. Hmm? He said like that. And he knows what he's talking about, because Prabhupada, if he says it, Krishna will make sure that it actually comes true. Huh? So we're speaking here about devotional potential, we're speaking here about the elegance, how elegantly we apply our Krishna consciousness. So that you're running in the marathon, but you don't have these six invisible enemies haunting your spiritual progress. Huh? So this first exercise, first point, how much is their balance? Because this is talking about the six things to avoid, and this first principle is around overeating and overcollecting. Okay? Eating more than the necessary or collecting more funds than required. Mm? And bear in mind one other point on this principle. When we over endeavor to collect funds, it also can indicate a lack of faith in Krishna. I'm accumulating because I fear that if I actually do what Krishna wants, he won't take care of me. Now, when I say over, I don't mean impractical. And I, I emphasize this because if I say anything that's impractical, people in turn, no one will say anything, but they'll think, yes, it's not practical, I don't have to listen to this. I won't follow this. I mean very practical. I mean very practical. I remember a few years ago when we were traveling with Chandra Mulli Maharaj, and Marge was giving the seminar, Srila Prabhupada, our founder Acharya, and we were speaking 
about life and having time to spend with family and so on and so forth. And I was just thinking that if life isn't balanced, you're working all the time, the relationships go down, one isn't actually satisfied even on the human level what to speak of transcendentally. Hmm? And again, who gets the blame? It's Krishna consciousness. Is this Krishna consciousness is too difficult? The materialists, they seem to be happier than we are, etc, etc, etc. This teaching of Rupa Goswami is because he is a spiritual genius who knows what we need to go back to the spiritual world. And therefore, not only is he given the detail, but please, please, please always remember this principle for the rest of your life. It's not about just practicing Krishna consciousness. It's about the expert practice of Krishna consciousness. They make a huge difference to what you experience. Huh? We have access to these books all the time. You can read these books all the time. You can meditate daily. How expertly am I applying this science of Krishna consciousness? And the more expert you apply, the more that you will relish devotional life in Krishna consciousness. Everyone in our International Society for Krishna Consciousness is explosive. What do I mean by that? If you as a devotee are happy, if you as a devotee are spiritually connected, do you have any idea how powerful that is? Do you have any You will come into a room and even before you said something, your consciousness will affect the environment. Hmm? As we were explaining in a previous retreat, and I remember whenever I hear Prabhupada disciples speak about Prabhupada, I always got that sense. It wasn't just that Prabhupada, you know, was clever in his speech. He carried a certain presence. There's a shakti there. He can walk into the room, say nothing, but you will feel that there's a, there's a shift, there's a difference here. Whenever we become more connected to Krishna, Krishna's potency and his mercy flows through that particular devotee. Hmm? We're dealing with very profound, very esoteric, very subtle science. In, uh, let's see, what is this literature? The Yoga, Yoga Sutras, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. It explains that one who is perfectly one who has perfected the ahimsa, non-violence, that means someone who doesn't speak violently, does not act violently, doesn't think violently. For such a person, no one can be aggressive in that person's presence. Because their consciousness has nothing within it which is of a violent nature. So when you're around them, there's nothing, you can't tune in, there's, no, there's nothing within them that you can resonate with to be aggressive. That means, ladies and gentlemen, the greatest gift that we all carry is the quality of our consciousness. The quality and the degree of our Krishna consciousness. And therefore, with people like Srila Prabhupada, and you see that with other senior advanced devotees, it's their consciousness that does so many things. And their words and all these other things, their actions are a manifestation of an actual deep, profound consciousness and a deep and profound connection to Krishna. And any one of you in this room can have the same thing by practice and by mercy. Hmm? So we, we haven't even begun to, our, our devotional life. There is so, so, so much more. Hmm? So much more. So this first thing is about this over-eating and over-collecting. We want to accept things as Krishna's mercy, accepting as much as needed for, and, and is favorable for our devotional service and not more than that. Hmm? Because there's no neutral position in the material world. When you accept more, guess what actually happens? You become a slave of what you accept. Hmm? We think that the conveniences of modern life are saving us time. They don't save you time necessarily. They take your time, <laughs> funnily enough. Whenever you have to maintain so many artificial things, they're taking your time. And, unfortunately, especially with modern technology, they zap your energy as well. Hmm? 
we are becoming, unfortunately, much more mechanical as a civilization. Right? And Marge alluded to this also. You know, now anyone can reach you anywhere in the world at any time. And is your life happier because of it? Be honest, right? You can, you know, from morning till evening, when you go to check your email, you can have like, you know, a hundred different emails. Much of them is junk email. Is your life, can you actually say that the quality of your life has improved because of it? Hmm? One of the worst examples of this is Facebook. The Facebook culture, you, you go onto Facebook, you see these snaps of people smiling, laughing and joking, and they're all miserable. Yeah, they were posing for the camera. I, I've seen people on Facebook smiling and laughing and joking together. I know for a fact they don't even like each other. I'm serious. But, you know, posing and this and that. And then other people see it and think that, well, everyone else seems to be so happy. I'm the only miserable person, right? So then they try and emulate that. But what you don't understand is, no, the people that you, who are smiling in that image, they're also miserable. They're also unhappy. So what Maya has done has just amplified the illusion. Mm? So that doesn't mean that we may or may not use technology for preaching. That's another thing. But my point is, please do not play into the illusion. Because what you do by playing into the illusion is you actually weaken yourself as an individual. And you, be, you find people now in this age, they are more and more insecure. Right? And that insecurity comes because, it, because these types of things intensify the bodily identification. Right? You're insecure, now it's even worse. You have to look a certain way, you have to be seen to be doing certain things. If you don't have certain types of you know, Twitter accounts or this and that, there's something wrong with you. It makes for a weaker society, a weaker individual. And we, we're trying to go back to Krishna. Hmm? Our culture should be that it doesn't have to look good, it actually is good. You understand? We shouldn't be the people who are posing in for, a for a photo, but rather people on a day-to-day -day basis, the relationships and the interaction is actually sweet, hmm? is actually fulfilling, <coughs> is actually powerful, because we know what to give. One more point on this overeating is this mood of gratification. The underlying principle of overeating is, I want to gratify my senses. And what is love? As Marj explained, and as is explained in Chaitanya Charitamrita, real love, love for Krishna, as is explained, is the desire to gratify the senses of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Hmm? So if we project a culture, and if we engage even subtly in things which are all about my own gratification, don't be surprised when you find it difficult to transform and to lead a life which is far, which is far more purely focused on Krishna's pleasure. Hmm? From the subtle, the gross develops. Does that make sense? Yeah? It begins subtly. That's why when you see Srila Prabhupada, you see Srila Prabhupada, there's, there's pictures of Prabhupada, he's drinking water. How does he do it? It's just done so aristocratically. His movements are beautiful because the consciousness is thoroughly pure. You understand? My excitement in spiritual life, and I would suggest that the excitement of any devotee, is that if we do these things, and if you look in your own life, you'll see even a little touch of Krishna consciousness is so powerful, it's made profound changes in our lives already, isn't it? Isn't it? I remember, I, I by nature am not tidy. I was shocked to see that sometimes nowadays, when I do things, it's just tied, and I think, where did that come from? That sneaked up on me. But it's because of this teaching and because of the association. Krishna wants to transform us. Hmm? And everything we need to be transformed is here, now. Again, I'm drilling the same point because it's important not to overload, but to give a few key things that you'll remember. It's all about the elegance and the quality of your application. Hmm? And if I asked you how many people in this room consciously make sure that they avoid these six things. I don't think many people will put their hands up. Does that make some sense? Yeah? We want to relish Krishna consciousness. Krishna, as Marge said, it is enjoyable. It's wonderful. 
huh, is fulfilling to the extent that it's done sincerely and done properly. Hmm? So this is the first of the six. Huh? So you hopefully have considered yourself in terms of how much we are affected by this, uh, this tendency for overeating or collecting more funds than required. Uh, over, you know, trying to accumulate. <clears throat> and also, what we can do, and actually maybe let's discuss this. What have you seen in your own life or in the lives of others that can be done to bring more balance in relation to this principle? Right? What can be done so we can move away from a tendency to overeat and overcollect? Any ideas? Or should I start? I will start with one thing. When I first heard from devotees about Prabhupada and what Prabhupada was like when he honored Prashant, they actually introduced mantra meditation into the hospitals and doctors were taught to do that. Then actually, there'll be a greater instance of health all around. In this previous statement that we made about eating more than necessary, according to Ayurveda, the root cause of all illnesses is bad digestion, and that is often to do with overeating. Hmm? And please, please don't think that because you're devotees and you're taking prasadam that you can eat what you like and it's not going to affect your body. Isn't it? It's going to affect your body. That body that, you, that your soul inhabits actually belongs to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That's the truth. So the question is, do you look after your body in the way that you want? Or do you look after your body in the way that Krishna wants? Hmm? What do you think is going to get you more spiritual benefit? Hmm? Isn't that, it's, it's so amazing. Prabhupada said Krishna consciousness is so amazing you might just miss it. If you do the same things you do normally, but you do them for the pleasure of Krishna, even that mentality is purifying. Hmm? Even that mentality of thinking, how would Krishna like me to look after his body? How would Krishna like me to look after these objects which belong to him? Isn't that amazing? And how, how, how few are the times that we do that? Huh? Some of us in this room will be practicing 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and we'll think, I've been practicing so long, and, you know, and, but you know, I'm, not, I'm not experiencing such high levels of Krishna consciousness. But actually, it's not that you're... Just because you come into this movement, it doesn't mean that every moment you're practicing Krishna consciousness. You're practicing Krishna consciousness when you're in Krishna consciousness. When you're, in other words, you're practicing Krishna consciousness when you're practicing Krishna consciousness. Right? So all those times when you're doing something else, that's why we're not moving forward as much as we want. Huh? These are the fine points. Often they don't talk about this. Oh yes, you're a devotee. Yeah, okay. But how, oft, how many times, how many hours in the day are you a devotee? Hmm? How many hours in our day are we doing things for the pleasure of the Supreme Personality of Godhead? How many hours in the day are we doing things for some other purpose? Hmm? And how expertly are we applying these points? So this point, point number two, over-endeavoring for mundane things that are difficult to obtain. We should understand that it cuts into our devotional life when we are overly attached and overly endeavoring for materialistic things. Hmm? But we know that there's a balance, as we said before. It's not too much, not too little. It's actually about dynamic balance. And therefore, I emphasize dynamic balance because what you need at different points may, may change. Does that make sense? Right? In London, we, um, we were looking at training for devotees who are going to get married. And I remember when I first heard that, um, that Chandra Mulli Maharaj did the seminar on you know, relationships and you know, grass to ashram, I was thinking how progressive this is. Huh? Because it's actually understanding what the situation is going to be and preparing people for that. Hmm? So they can live a realistic, grounded life, but with Krishna still as the focus. Hmm? And how much Krishna will be pleased with his devotees for their wonderful wisdom and insight. Hmm? 
And if we take to these teachings, we will also have that dynamic balance. If we live, if we, sorry, live these teachings wisely. Okay? This is our theme for all, for, you know, throughout this seminar. It's not enough to say I'm a devotee. Right? If you did a study, you'll find that the quality or the expertise of how people apply this teaching, the spectrum is vast. Right? You have some people, this is why it gets tricky. There's some people, they don't apply Krishna consciousness very well, right, in this life. But they've got great credit from their previous life, right? So they don't apply it so well right now, but they actually have a lot of credit, so there's a lot of taste. Someone else comes in, they're trying to do it very well, but they're starting from scratch in this lifetime. Hmm? Someone else has a different situation, someone else has a different situation. So therefore, you can't really compare. The best you can do is do the best you can, under guidance, to do everything expertly, and then you'll know that you're doing the best you can, and Krishna will help. Hmm? Because Krishna, he responds to the endeavor of his devotee. Hmm? Think about this point very carefully. You are getting your personal reciprocation from Krishna based upon how much you are actually trying to be a devotee, trying to please him. Hmm? And so at every single moment, every single one of us has a different degree to which we're receiving Krishna's reciprocation. Huh? And we can also, therefore, receive more of Krishna's mercy. Okay, so let's do an exercise on this second point as well. So again, think about this point in terms of over-endeavouring for mundane things, especially mundane things that are difficult to obtain. Why, does, why is it said here, difficult to obtain? There's a reason. When something is difficult to obtain, not only do you have to put physical effort to achieve it, what other type of effort do you have to put in to get something that's difficult? Financial? Anything else? Mental effort. Hmm? Time, energy, finances, mental effort, and all of those things that you're putting in for that mundane achievement or that mundane endeavor are things that are taking away some time and energy that could be engaged in devotional life. Mm -hmm. So it's not neutral. Nothing's neutral. Mm -hmm. So we are paying a price in different ways, shapes and forms. Mm -hmm. let, us, let us look at this point. Well, I'd like you to do. Okay, actually, let me share a few more things before we go into that. Okay, so in the commentary by Bhakti Notako, sorry, yeah, Bhakti Notako, he explains that Krishna is only achieved by one who he himself chooses. It's a very powerful point. So he decides that he's going to give himself to his devotees. Hmm? At the same time, in the Madhuri Kadambini, Srila Vishnu Chakravali Thakur says, effort attracts mercy. So when the endeavor is going somewhere other than to Krishna, then because less effort is going towards Krishna, the reciprocation of mercy is not necessarily as great as it could be. Hmm? He wants a relationship with you, but you have to want to be with him. Does that make sense? So as you surrender, Krishna says, Yetaman Prapadyante, I reward them accordingly. As they surrender, he is reciprocating with that surrender. Hmm? Think about this point very carefully. So again, in your own life, think about this point. To what degree are we over-endeavoring? Hmm? When we were speaking also in London about training the devotees to understand their nature, even before they go into further studies, what I've seen is that generally the devotees who have a clear understanding of their nature and who are well situated, they are having a much better Krishna conscious experience. Huh? How does this work? See, one, one person's over endeavor is not necessarily the over-endeavor of another individual. For example, do you have anyone in your community who's, who's naturally good at management? 
Do you know people like that? Yeah, sometimes. So sometimes in the community, you have certain people, they, they can manage in their sleep, right? In fact, they love managing, right? And then the other person, <laughs> you get the opposite end of the spectrum, the other person, you know, they, they couldn't basically manage their way out of the room. You understand? Right? Yeah, they have struggled to tie their shoes. So actually, what's interesting is, if you give one person management, he's not stressed by it. You give the same task to another individual, it's stressful. Because it's much more of a stretch. So Srila Prabhupada has made such a powerful statement on this. In the 8th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, chapter 2, text number 30, Prabhupada speaks in the purple of the pastime of Gajendra the elephant. This elephant was being attacked by a crocodile in the water. They fought for 1,000 years. Huh? Now that's a fight. Right? 1,000 years. Now, what's so amazing, and you know, I encourage you all to read this purple. 8th Canto, chapter 2, text number 3. What's so mind-blowingly amazing is how Prabhupada explains in that purple. A, a point that, again, you can't get by your own observation. You have to receive it from authority. So Prabhupada explains that the elephant, Gajendra, was actually far more powerful than the crocodile. Right? But in the 1,000 years of fighting, because they were in the water, which is a natural environment for who? The crocodile or the elephant? The crocodile. The crocodile was getting energy and sensual strength and nourishment from the environment. And the elephant who was more powerful, being in a foreign environment in the water, was actually becoming weak. Then Prabhupada goes on to explain that in our fight against Maya, we should not pull ourselves in a position where the senses and the mind and so on will become weak. Hmm? How many times have you heard that point before? Hmm? Isn't that amazing? So that means, ladies and gentlemen, that our situation is feeding into our ability to fight Maya from a position of strength. Now that's a revolutionary point. And I'll be honest, I suspect that's a revolutionary point for many people in our ISKCON society who haven't really deeply grasped that point. Huh? Prabhupada is saying, you should position your, you should be in a position of strength to fight Maya. Then he goes on to explain that what constitutes a normal condition is different for different people. Again, such a beautiful point. Because Prabhupada being thoroughly personal, he does not have some kind of superficial impersonalistic idea. It's very mature, very healthy, very refined. That for different people, different devotees, they'll have a, a different situation which is a position of strength for that particular individual. Hmm? Now, just imagine one thing for a moment for me. I would like you to imagine just for a moment that everyone in our ISKCON society was well situated. Right? Just imagine for a moment that every single member of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness was well situated. Do you think our movement would, would advance very strongly in helping the world and sharing Krishna with the world? Yes or no? Yes. Hmm? Isn't that amazing? It's not that you'd have to change the individual. It's again, application. Application. How we actually live this teaching instead of reading it and then forgetting what we've, writ what we've read and thinking that it's nice philosophy when we, when we don't understand that Prabhupada is saying to us, no, I've given you this to live by. I've given you this to apply in your life. You will see how potent these words really are when you live them. Hmm? The real potency of these teachings will really emanate into the environment and will 
come through you, through your own example, when you live what is written in these literatures. Hmm? So please think about that point. Huh? That means that right now, so many members of our society can be much more powerful in their devotional service and offer much more in quality to our movement and even to be more peaceful. If they simply, and this is done with guidance, if they simply situate themselves properly, and this, these things are all speaking about how to situate yourself. Right? These are relating to how to situate yourself properly. Not overeating and overcollecting. It's about how to situate your life. Huh? Not over endeavoring for mundane things. It's about how to situate your life. Hmm? Number three, talking unnecessarily about mundane subject matters. Huh? I'm going to share something with you. It's, it's, it's heavy. It is heavy. So recently when there was one mentorship discussion in London, one person brought up the point that even, in, even sometimes amongst devotees, there'll be illicit activity and sometimes you know, children can be born out of that illicit connection like that. And then someone even said that in some cases even unfortunately, in some cases unfortunately, even some of those children, they end up being aborted. And that's a very heavy thing to say. It's an extremely heavy thing to say. Huh? Why am I bringing this up? This third point is about talking unnecessarily about mundane subject matters. And in the commentary by Bhattino Tarko, he talks about different types of prajapa. Did you know that there's actually a connection between what you say and your sex desire? Did you know that? The tongue vibrates and tastes. And because of this line, if you're able to control this, it actually has an effect upon helping you to actually be free of unnecessary sexual agitation. Huh? Isn't that amazing? Again, every time you read Prabhupada's books, you just find the things that he's going to say in there you can't work out. You need to hear this from some authority, from realized sources. Huh? When someone is engaging in prajalpa, gossip, oh, did you hear about that person? I heard that this person did this. And you know, oh, you know what? You know, I heard he fell down. You know, with all of these things, you actually become more sexually agitated by engaging in prajalpa. Right? Isn't that amazing? So that means also the reverse is true. If we are more careful about what we speak, huh, you become less agitated. As Marge said, when you're less sexually agitated, what happens to the determination? Determination goes up. Huh? Now again, imagine this. We have two individuals, they've come back from holiday, right? And they go up, they need to take their luggage up a flight of stairs. Okay? Now, both individuals, their luggage weighs the same. You've got your big suitcase, it's full of clothes, they're heavy. Now, when they're going up the stairs, one person takes the luggage up, it's very easy for that person. The other person, they struggle with the luggage, right? What's the difference between the two people? Why is it that the luggage weighs the same for both individuals? One person takes it up easily, the other person struggles. What's the difference? One stronger. Hmm? So the more spiritually strong a devotee is, the more that we have received the mercy of Guru and Krishna, it is to that extent that your experience of all of the challenges in your, in your spiritual life are completely transformed. Huh? We think it's a suitcase. We think it's a challenge. No, it's you. It's how strong you are relative to the challenges that Krishna or the material energy who's testing on Krishna's behalf is bringing into our life. So we say, why is Krishna giving me this suitcase? No, you should ask yourself the question, why aren't I strong enough to be able to take this suitcase up these stairs very easily? Hmm? We don't know what we've done in previous lives. So we don't know what challenges may come upon us. But what we can do, 
What we can do at any moment is continually work on ourselves to be a greater recipient of Krishna's mercy. Hmm? And that is the best insurance policy that means that whatever comes your way, if you are well connected to the Vaishnavas and if you are deliberately trying to develop your Krishna consciousness, then it is a guarantee that whatever comes your way, you'll be in the best position and in the best consciousness in which you to deal with the situation. Does that make sense? Hmm? Again, same point, the expertise of application. Hmm? So next time you, do, you think about gossiping about another person, please read the case that everyone in our movement is struggling and there's a few people who are doing well. It should be the case that everyone is doing well because everyone understands and is expertly applying this and is relishing Krishna consciousness. There will come a time in this movement, ladies and gentlemen, where we will practice devotional life so expertly that when the Vaishnavas go into any setting, people can tell just by the state of consciousness, by the presence of that individual, he must be one of Prabhupada's followers. Hmm? And the presence of that Vaishnava, that will be the biggest preaching. Before they've even said a word, they can just feel there's something different about this person. Hmm? And it's our consciousness. Huh? And you see that often. You look at Prabhupada, for example. Externally, how is it that this person who looks externally like an Indian gentleman, how is he able to attract people from such diverse backgrounds? Isn't it? You look at Prabhupada's disciples and the followers and you think, how is it that this one man, personality rather, can attract so many people from so many different backgrounds. Because those people don't have so much in common with each other, but they all love Prabhupada, isn't it? They all, and they'll sit there and they'll talk to you, Prabhupada did this, Prabhupada said that. Even the smallest thing that he does is so potent. It's not an external thing. These are manifestations of the spiritual energy. Hmm? This is so amazing. If we're connected, Guess what's going to happen? Krishna's going to do it through you. Hmm? All the miracles that have been happening in this movement, it's Krishna doing it and he wants to give the credit to you. Hmm? And these six things are the things which get in the way of Krishna working through us. Huh? So in one sense, you can consider that these prescriptions if we remove these six things, you become more and more a candidate for spiritual empowerment. Krishna can work through that particular instrument who removes these blocks. Huh? Does that make some sense? Huh? So these are very profound points. Huh? The critic takes the karma. If you criticize another devotee huh? and they don't retaliate, you get some of their bad, their sinful karma they get some of your good karma. Huh? So when Krishna says, <coughs> oh, opposite, sorry. Oh, yes. Yeah, so when you criticize, yeah, they get some of your good karma, you get some of their sinful karma. So when, when we follow these rules, the person who benefits the most from following Srila Rupa Goswami is who? Who benefits the most from following Srila Rupa Goswami? You do. Yeah? Is that clear? I want you to do an honest evaluation because we want to try and be more and more real. Let's be honest. Think about how much of a tendency you have for Prajalpa. <laughs> okay? Think about it. And I mean this in subtle ways. One level is what you say, but even the mentality. Yeah? Think about it. How much do you find that you have an uh, a kind of inclination towards seeing or speaking about something negative in relation to another individual. Hmm? Bhaktivinoda Thakur has given the six and um, the ten defenses. He has looked at the ten offenses against the holy name and he's given activities to counter each of those ten. 
The first and most dangerous is to blaspheme the devotees who have dedicated their lives to the propagation of the holy names of the Lord. And he says that the way to avoid criticism of Vaishnavas is to engage the tongue in the glorification of those same Vaishnavas. There's a science to this. There's a science to this. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur, when devotees would have conflicts, he would get them together, he would sit them down and say, now, okay, now say something good about this other person. Right? I want you to express something about this other person that is positive, that is good. Hmm? And then they'll have to look and think and come up with something that they could genuinely appreciate. Hmm? It, it's explained in the Yoga Sutras that when you, if, if you consciously think about the good qualities of a person, it counteracts the tendency to think negatively towards them. Isn't that amazing? Prabhupada's teachings are so clever, so profound, so elegantly done. He'll give you a statement, but there's a whole psychology in there, and there's a whole science behind it. Hmm? He'll just say, don't criticize, glorify them. But there's a science behind it. It's not artificial. You do that constantly, you will actually lose the tendency towards criticism of devotees. You lose the tendency towards criticizing devotees, you don't make offenses to devotees, how much your spiritual life will fly. Hmm? As one spiritual leader said years ago, he was saying that for the years of devotional life, for the years of service I've done, he said, I should have been at the platform of Bhava Bhakti, he was saying. He's saying that the reason why I'm nowhere near Bhava Bhakti is because of how many offenses I've made. Interesting, isn't it? It's not the hours you put in. Hmm? It's the quality of the devotional service minus the avoidance of those things which destroy our spiritual progress. Hmm? Application of spiritual science. Huh? The science of self-realization. Adhyatma vidya, vidyanam. Huh? This is how it really works. Uh, this is how we really grow in, in Krishna consciousness.